Hey everybody, it is the 6th of May, Monday, uh, 2013. I am Wes Hagen, I'm the vineyard manager and winemaker here at Clove Pepe Vineyards and Estate Wines, and we are in uh, the Santa Rita Hills of Northern Santa Barbara County, California, United States. Uh, we take questions via Facebook and Twitter, at Wes Hagen, W-E-S-H-A-G-E-N. We also, uh, I'm also checking out the wine subreddit all the time, and we're going to start taking questions off Reddit, because I find it's a wonderful place to, to get uh, information from what people want to know about wine. So uh, last, uh, last week we did uh, 200 million years of wine history in 10 minutes, and we had a really, really good uh, response. So I promised this week we would go and I would give you the second part of that story. I think last year, or last week, we got up to uh, the Roman days. So I took you up through when there was one continent, Pangaea, that continent separated. There were three major subspecies uh, of, uh, of grapes, the American, European, and, uh, and the Asian subspecies talked to you a little bit about uh, Asian winemaking, talked to you a little about the beginning of uh, European winemaking, and really the, the seminal moment, of course, was when someone around 7 to 7,500 to 8,500 years ago, somewhere around 6,000 BCE, uh, we discovered a hermaphroditic grapevine, and that hermaphroditic grapevine was sort of the mother-father vine of all vines that spread uh, throughout Asia Minor and into Europe. So now we're, you know, looking at everything from Albarino to Zinfandel comes from one hermaphrodite grape that was taken out of the Transcaucasus between the Black Sea and the Caspian Sea about 8,000 8, years ago. Um, so uh, really we're looking forward to what happened once that one vine started to spread throughout the area and basically got into Europe. How did it get into Europe? Well, it really got into the Middle East first and then it really got down into uh, Egypt. Egypt really uh, took the culture of wine quite a far way until uh, really, um, uh, what am I, uh, Greece actually took Europe uh, took wine and made, made it European. And then the Romans took Greek wine and actually made wine uh, just as important as in Rome as it was all over Europe because Rome really, everywhere the Roman armies went, they actually would drop grapes off. And, uh, you know, Bordeaux was planted by 73 AD, uh, sort of in between Julius Caesar and Caesar Augustus, um, Octavian. Uh, and uh, interestingly enough, I read this morning in preparation for this that by the 4th century AD, about 367, there was uh, a Roman uh, writing that actually said uh, the vineyards of Burgundy were actually, were, had, had been planted and actually had gone into a state of disrepair. So believe it or not, by the 4th century AD, not only had Burgundy been planted, but Burgundy was actually losing a little bit of its patina of quality because some of the vineyards had not been properly cared for. But really what happened in the Roman world, well we go back to the Greeks, obviously when the Greeks got wine culture they took it quite a far distance and uh, actually uh, the idea of the symposia of, of landed Athenian gentry sitting in a room uh, with harp music and being uh, fed these beautiful, you know, thin craters, uh, crater bowls of wine. And as they would drink three or four bowls of this wine, their host would recognize when they were drunk, but before they got drunk, their wine would be taken away. And everyone at the symposia, under the influence of wine, was asked to stand up, uh, sing, a, you know, sing a song, uh, uh, recite a poem, make a political discourse, um, or, uh, or something like that. And then once they were done, they'd all sort of talk shit about it. And uh, that, that sort of conversation that would occur on a subject at this symposia actually became really the, uh, the basis for what we recognize as democracy today, which is take an idea, put it in front of a n large number of people, have those people sort of debate that, whether it's under the influence of wine or not. Um, same thing with judges in hashish back in uh, Saudi Arabia and many of the places in the Moorish Empire, that the judges would smoke hashish for wisdom the same way that these people would actually drink wine so they could see through to the truth of the situation in vino veritas, as the Italians once said. In wine there is truth. So if we move forward from the Greeks taking wine culture into Europe and doing a few things like inventing democracy and working out various ideas of philosophy at the symposium where, there, where there's wine being being consumed, uh, the Roman world got it and really made the Roman Empire the dominion of wine. So if, if Greeks actually sort of invented European wine culture, then the Romans actually brought it throughout Europe and made it the dominion of, of European culture. Wine became very, very important to European culture. Uh, the Romans recognized that there was a lot of... Um, uh, people trying to grow grapes in other parts of their uh, of the Roman Empire, specifically 200 million amphora of wine were imported into the Roman Empire uh, from Spain. So Spain was one of their main 
um, uh, competitors. Uh, the one place, a couple places, once they got far enough up in uh, northern Europe, above Germany, they didn't plant many grapes if, if the uh, Roman Empire reached that far. But the major place that the Romans really were in that they didn't grow grapes was England. Uh, so that's one reason why beer culture has always been so much more important in England because you can transport or grow uh, hops and grain in England, uh, but you can't really get wine grapes uh, ripe maybe a little bit in the southern uh, parts of England they're experimenting with some sparkling wine. But in general, the Roman Empire uh, was generally using uh, Gaul, which was France, Germany, Austria, uh, and regions that were uh, arid, like up through Spain and Portugal, to, to do most of their wine production. Um, I was interesting, interesting to note, too, that uh, with all this new stuff in the news this week about France and England starting to sell off all the expensive wine in their national cellars, sort of this austerity program, there was actually an austerity program in Rome in between uh, Julius Caesar and Caesar Augustus, where Augustus thought that uh, the stabbing and the destruction and the murder of, of Julius was, of Caesar was actually a uh, sort of an indication that the empire needed to get back into a state of austerity where um, money and uh, all these fine trappings weren't so important. So even though Julius Caesar almost drank uh, almost always this wine called Falernian, which was considered the best uh, wine uh, anywhere in, uh, in Italy uh, and probably anywhere in the world at that point, uh, Augustus, uh, to show that he was willing to take measures of austerity, uh, would not drink Falernian at his table and would drink a slightly, uh, what we would consider like a premier cru or a super second, a very delicious, you know, wonderful wine, but not a wine that was extraordinarily expensive. So basically, when the Romans had uh, conquered most of Europe, everywhere that they conquered, they dropped off grapevines. And those grapevines adapted. They were all brought by the Romans as only a few varietals, but then over a few hundred years, they adapted to the local uh, climate. They adapted to the local soil. And then human beings took those random mutations and allowed those grapes to become new grapes that were preferred by different regions. For example, Treminer was brought over the Alps. It picked up a, a spicy character. The Germans loved it. They kept the grape and called it the spicy Treminer, the Gewurztraminer. So everywhere grapes go, they mutate, but the mutations are random. So as humans, we have to keep those mutations and uh, try to uh, use them uh, to uh, plant uh, more generations of grapes that make wonderful and delicious things. So we move forward through the Roman days, basically through the Middle Ages, where uh, the, the dominion of wine is taken over not really by the Roman army, but more by the Catholic Church. Uh, most of the great uh, vineyards in, Europe's were, uh, were, uh, in Europe were kept by, um, by monks, uh, and uh, they were worked by the clergy, and the wines were generally kept by the clergy. Lots of them were used for uh, either for wine for, the, for communion or the Eucharist, uh, but many of those wines were actually kept within the church and the monks uh, would drink them and the uh, nuns would drink them and would give them wine and sometimes of course they would have surplus that they could sell so they could bring money into the uh, to the monastery to make sure it continued to happen so you can look at sort of the big sort of dark ages of wine being uh, a wine industry that was part of Europe part of the clergy and part of the part of the peasant way of living too obviously anywhere that wine could be grown it probably was grown all the different varietals were adapting but most of that sort of, that dark age of wine, you can probably say, you can put wine in the category from the Roman days, really, and the early writings of Rome, all the way up to Louis Pasteur. So let's end with Pasteur today. Uh, until Louis Pasteur uh, um, in, uh, looked at, basically, and saw uh, yeast and different uh, bacteria that would uh, actually help in the secondary fermentation. Before Pasteur, we did not know how wine fermented. So when Louis Pasteur basically showed how yeast turns uh, sugar into alcohol and CO2, we really had no clue. So Louis Pasteur really revolutionized the idea that wine could be a science. It wasn't just a miracle that God created this wonderful substance from grapes. There was an actual a scientific and physical process that could be proven. So look up Pasteur, see what he did. It wasn't just about pasteurizing milk. I mean, he was a brilliant brilliant scientist that basically revolutionized wine and how we make wine. Now that wine's a scientific process, it's very easy to uh, control, it's very easy to uh, steer a fermentation in the direction that we want. So that's about it. I wanted to talk a little bit about Rome de Pasteur. Ten minutes went really quick. Uh, if you have any questions, please post them either on Reddit, or on my Facebook page, or anywhere else you want to. Other than that, I had a great time talking with you guys. If you have questions, let me know. Otherwise, I'll just pull them from Reddit or wherever. And uh, we'll see you guys next Monday for another video.